Welcome to City Cinematheque, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today it's our pleasure to present the 1932 American film, Bird of Paradise, directed by King Vidor and starring Dolores Del Rio and Joel McRae. This is the story of the love affair between a native girl and an American sailor. It's part of a genre we don't see much of these days, what you might call the romance of the South Seas. There's a lot to talk about about this film, and we'll be doing so afterwards with two guests. It's a pleasure to welcome John Mulholland, a documentary filmmaker who's working on a film about Joel McRae, and Peter McRae, the son of Joel McRae, who will give us a perspective on his father's career. Now, take this opportunity to go back in time in Hollywood to 1932, before the Hayes Code came into place, to look at Bird of Paradise. Welcome back to City Cinematheque. I hope you've enjoyed today's screening of Bird of Paradise, a film that's volcanic in, shall I say, a number of ways. We've got 30 minutes to talk about a number of aspects of the film. And today, it's my pleasure to have two guests here. Returning to City Cinematheque is our friend uh, John Mulholland, a documentary filmmaker who has a specialty in working on the history of Hollywood. And while John won't allow me to call him an historian of uh, Hollywood cinema, he sure knows a heck of a lot about it. Uh, it's, another, it's another pleasure uh, to have here today uh, Peter McRae, the son of Joel McRae. Uh, who, in addition to his, uh, how, how shall I put it, biological credentials, uh, also did extensive interviewing uh, with, his, with his father for his father's memoirs. Welcome to City Cinematheque. Thank you. All right, Jerry. Great. Uh, Peter, I'm going to start, uh, start with you. Um, obviously, you weren't around at the period in which uh, Bird of Paradise was made in 1932. Uh, so how did you um, come to find out about uh, who your father was in this earlier stage in his career? Well, I, my father wasn't even married to my mother at the time he did this picture. And um, he, uh, when I grew up, I, I was born when he was 50. So he retired when I was about seven. So I really knew him more as a rancher, which was his avocation. He would always wanted to be a rancher and bought a ranch in 1933. And so I really knew him as a rancher who signed autographs once in a while. You know, I mean, we'd go out to dinner and once in a while someone would come up and recognize him. And so I was not really involved or interested or, or focused on the movie industry at all as I grew up. And when I got into college, I got into film in about halfway through college and started a film career of my own as a film editor and started to have much more interest in his career and he started telling stories about you know experiences he had had people he'd worked with and my mother urged me to tape his memoirs so for the last 10 years of his life I taped taped his memoirs and we would just meet periodically and and sit out on the front lawn at the ranch and and uh, talk about the old days so okay that's, that's good what um, 1932 uh, is a couple of years before the thing called the Hayes Code which restricts what can be said, what can be enacted in cinema goes, goes in, into shape. John, you want to sort of, uh, uh, what kind of period is 1932 in, in Hollywood? Certainly not 1942, and, and certainly not 1922. What kind of moment? Well, I think that this movie, Bird of Paradise, is a perfect example of what kind of mood Hollywood was in those days. A year or two later, this movie couldn't have been made. The, uh, uh, the, just it's little, uh, as I mentioned, there's a line early on where a couple of men are at the, looking at the island and one says, what was the name of this island? And the other says, I think these are the Virgin Islands. The other man says, gee, I hope not. <laughs> you couldn't get away with a line like that in 1934. Yeah. That, the whole era was different. There was a freedom, a sense of uh, abandon about it. We'll, we'll capture life. It went very quickly. It right. Went, Right, and of course, one of the things is that there's a particular window because there's this combination of the new technology of sound, because sound is less than five years old. So people are, you know, perforce experimenting. They're discovering what you can do in terms of storytelling 
uh, from this, but there's also no restriction on what kinds of stories, or uh, certainly less restriction, as we would put it, than comes into place after uh, uh, Hollywood chooses uh, in a self-defensive gesture to self-regulate itself for um, you know roughly the next 30 to 35 years, according to how how you're uh, uh, counting on those things. Mm -hmm. How did you um, get Peter to to uh, know about this this period, or what did you find out when you started talking with your father about this period? Well, he he really uh, this was a very critical period for him. It was it was his first starring role, and the way that came about was he was friends with uh, David Selznick. He'd gotten to know him through his brother Myron, who was an agent who was interested in possibly representing my father at one time. And Myron invited him down to his beach house, which was on Santa Monica Beach, and David was there. And my dad was a body surfer and a volleyball player. He played beach volleyball and, and body surfed. And so David saw him body surfing, and he said, if you teach me to do that, I'll make you a star. And you know, Pop had had a few leads right. and some smaller parts before that. So um, he said, OK, come on in. So they went in the ocean, and he showed David how to ride waves. and. David was kind of, he was gutty. He said he had a lot of guts, but he said he didn't quite get it right. <laughs> he did his best, and he tried, and he rode, finally rode a wave in. And he said, you know, this is too cold. Let's, let's go get in, in the pool. So they went back in, and Pop forgot about the whole thing. And a few months later, he got a call from a casting director, and he said, uh, King Vidor wants to see you. And Pop said, fine. King Vidor wants to see me. I'm there. <laughs> And so he went in, and King said, uh, how would you like to star opposite Dol Dolores Del Rio and go to uh, Hawaii and star in the Bird of Paradise? And Pop said, it's done, you know? <laughs> and he said, he said, you'll still get your, he was getting about 500 a week at that time. Right. And he said, you'll still get the same salary. And Dolores is getting, I don't know, she was getting 5,000 a week, I right. think. And he said, but you'll have a starring role. And Pop thought, I'll be damned, Selznick made good, you know? And, but the interesting <clears throat> thing that came out of that was a few nights later, uh, Dolores had a party at her house, and Chaplin was there, and a couple of directors, and, um, uh, oh, now his name slips my mind, um, Jack Gilbert. Okay. And Jack Gilbert was there. And uh, at dinner, they were talking about the picture and how Dolores was going off to make this picture in, in Hawaii. And she had just married Cedric Gibbons, which was a tremendous disappointment to my dad because he wasn't married yet, and he had a big crush on Dolores. And how? Why would he have a big crush? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you see the movie, yeah, exactly. Having seen the movie now, <laughs> you know, um, and uh, that wasn't a body double swimming underneath the boat. And right. so, anyway, they're talking about the movie, and Pop notices that Jack Gilbert is listening very carefully to this. And after dinner, he went out to his car, and, and Gilbert came out, and he said, he said, you know. I really started with King Vidor. I mean, he made me a big star. I mean, we did the big parade together and made $18 million, whatever. In, in those days, was a lot of yeah, big indeed. gross. And he said, you know, they're freezing me out of the business because he had been in silence and was right. getting frozen out. They thought he couldn't, didn't sound right in talkies. Right. So he was getting frozen out. He said, you know, I really need a comeback, and this picture would be a great comeback for me. And he said, I'll give you what I would get for this picture and you can, I'll take your salary. I'll take the 500 a week, I get 5,000 a week. I'll give you my salary. I really want to do this picture. But he said, these guys are squeezing me. And he said, I can't, I don't know what to do. And Pop was just blown away, you know. He couldn't right. believe this was happening. So he said, well, you know, let me, he's just a young guy. Right, absolutely. He's just getting started. And he, he said, well, let me think about it and I'll get back to you. I'll talk to King. So he, next day he went and told King the story, and King said, my God, this is a movie. This is better than the movie, you know, <laughs> these kind of things happening. And he said, well, what do you think we ought to do? Pop said, I feel terrible. It's the guy's life, you know. I mean, he said, I, I've always wanted to be a cowboy. If I end up a cowboy, I'm okay, but right. he really needs this. He said, well, let's go see Selznick. So they, they, so they went up to Selznick's office, and Pop said they went in, and Selznick had a sink in, his, in the corner of his office, and he had his shirt off and his suspenders on, and... He said uh, he just never stopped shaving. He just was, you know, looking at him in the mirror. And he said, uh, he said, uh, Jack Gilbert's dead. And Pop said, well, No, I just. And then he realized what he meant. He said they and they had just frozen him out of the business. They didn't want to give him that break. And Pop said, Well, please, if you ever to King, he said, if you talk to him, just tell him I at least made the gesture because I feel terrible. Right. You know. Right. Well, you know what 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 these two uh, stories you just told 
are so interesting to me, the reason they're so interesting to me, is because on the one hand, one seems to illustrate a very different world in which everything is sort of open. I mean, LA is a much smaller town. Oh, yeah. um, you know, deals are made in one sense in a rather a casual, a casual way. Your father went to Pomona State, or Pomona was College, yeah. Pomona College, mm -hmm. and was um, you know someone from the area. And here's this young man of of extraordinary athletic abilities, one might add, mm -hmm. uh, that we see, mm -hmm. you know, there who you know comes in through this one door that seems to open in a way that wouldn't open in, in this in the post-war epic or even a number of years later. Yet on the other hand, you've got you, you've got those hard facts of the industry yeah. uh, that are already in place that you can be at the top, uh, and in five years later you can be, you know, someone who's completely forgotten and certainly not castable yep. uh, in, certain, uh, in, in certain ways. Yeah. Well, well, this also, this is also interesting to me, this notion of this picture, as I, I introduced it as such, as a romance of the South Seas, mm -hmm. uh, which is certainly not the kind of film we're used to. Mm -hmm. These uh, the, uh, the, these days, I, I would think maybe the last kind of thing that was really a big hit was again the remake of the Blue Lagoon mm -hmm. a number of um, uh, uh, of years ago. What do, you, what do you think of this whole use of the South Seas uh, in this movie? I mean, it presented certain technical problems for the for, for, for the filmmakers, but um, <coughs> the amazing thing to me about this is that this is, and I mean this with all due respect. You could describe this film to some people, and they would think it's ri a ridiculous film. Mm -hmm. But it's not a ridiculous film. And even though the genre is uh, uh, one not popular and a bit uh, disregarded these days, mm -hmm. uh, it's nonetheless a really compelling piece of work mm -hmm. um, at, at, at all levels. What do you think, make, John, makes the film work in certain uh, ways? I. This is going to sound like an odd word. There's a modesty to it. There was no attempt to make a grandiose. The, mm. the pictorial flavor was allowed to be what it is. They, they didn't enhance it. it. It wasn't something that said, we're going to make this bigger and larger than it need be. It was only enough to allow the characters to act within the habitat, in effect. There was no sense of this is going to be an epic. The, the land spoke for itself, the foliage spoke for itself, the sound spoke for itself, and the characters operated within that. And I, I think that was a very shrewd move on Vidor's part, because had you dominated the characters, then they'd have really been absurd. I mean, you'd have lost the meshing of the two cultures. I mean, it was basically it ended up, it was a Casablanca ending. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, it, mm -hmm. and, but that would have been absurd if it was this big epic. What, what makes it work is you've got to know them. No, I think, I, I think you're on the mark because there's this kind of balance uh, between the fact that the, uh, certainly the visual aspects of the film are, are compelling uh, in, in, uh, in every way, but they could be overblown. And mm -hmm. there's a, a match between the sort of scale of the romance and the narrative, uh, and the exotic uh, and the exotic setting uh, that a, a lesser director uh, would have gone for. I mean, you're you're paying all the money to go to Hawaii. You're paying all the money to do the underwater shots uh, that were done apparently on the tank. They did. It was a production that moved around a great deal, but it it did go to Hawaii to do all these things. Mm -hmm. Vidor does say in his memoirs that there were one of those things of they got there and everybody. Well, of course there are palm trees down on the beach no palm trees on the beach. They had to bring palm trees down <laughs> and plant them. Then there was a storm and all the palm leaves blew off. So they had to go nail palm leaves. <laughs> <laughs> typical movies. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Ab absolutely. Now, did your father talk uh, 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 about this production itself uh, when he was talking with you? He didn't talk in tremendous detail, although he was it was exciting to be a young guy and have a starring role and having to take a ship, you know, five days, the Lurleen, I think it was called, that uh, took them to Hawaii. It was right. the only way you could get there. And I think the biggest thing that impressed him was that he was starring opposite Dolores Del Rio and, and doing scenes as they were where she's, you know, 
taking the mango juice and squeezing it in his mouth and things right. like that. <laughs> that was, was sort of the highlight of the movie. <laughs> but but wouldn't you point out that you're, if, if you didn't get the point from watching your father in this, he was a, a young man at this oh, time. Yeah. This is about as exciting yeah. as a job can get in the world. Oh, yeah. yeah. And she had just gotten married to Cedric Gibbons, who was a big art director, and, and, uh, and he stayed behind to work at the studio. And... Um, her mother came to chaperone her, right. and she kept a very close eye on Pop. So. <laughs> well, uh, what you know? Did he? Did this teach um, your your father sort of any lessons about how he would uh, desire to manage his career, or how he should be managing his career? He really approached his career as a business. He 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 really called himself a performer rather than an actor. He never considered himself an actor's actor. He didn't try to become the person in you know the way a Paul Muni or you know Robert De Niro does now where they really just inhabit the role he played it as himself if he were there you know yeah. and he looked at the business as he thought if I'm not a great actor and I don't really feel like I have that that angle I'm gonna have to play it safe in choosing good parts working with good directors and I'd rather be in a better picture with a better director and be second to a great female lead, as he was in this picture and several others, where the, the female lead was really the key right. character and he was the supporting male lead, that, you know, why not? You know, right. so he, he really approached it more carefully. He was great at analyzing scripts and picking good scripts, and he knew as much what to turn down as to accept. I mean, he turned down, even as a young starting actor, which very rarely would happen, right. He turned down King Kong, he turned down later uh, Lost Weekend, he turned down uh, Hurricane with John Ford, he turned down several pictures that you'd say, gee, if, if you were a young starting actor, you wouldn't say so cavalierly, I don't think I'm right for it. You know, He turned down actually later playing Will Rogers, who was his mentor, um, and told Michael Curtis, who was going to direct it, he said, I'm not good enough for the part, and Curtis said, that's the first time I've ever heard an actor say they're not good enough or something, you know. And but he he really thought I'd rather, you know, pick the right part and have a good relationship with a really good director, and yeah. that made the difference. And I'm curious where uh, this this um, not just instinct for scripts, but the, what you uh, it's interesting you didn't say that you said he really knew how to read and understand and analyze the script. Where do you think that came from? I mean, his parents, his mother had been a teacher, and his parents were very literate and literature oriented people and he read a lot growing up and I think that he just had a, a part of it was that and I think part of it was just you know some people are born with certain talents and that was one of his right. that he had a sense of what was a, made a good story and he unerringly picked good scripts I mean if he had a choice in fact there were some cases where he got into a picture where he wasn't cast right and he didn't like the script like he was under contract right. in fact this happened with Selznick after Bird of Paradise he had done a few pictures with uh, Constance Bennett co-starring with her and he was under contract with Selznick and Selznick put him in a part that he was really kind of a third right. level. He wasn't co-starred with, with Constance Bennett, this was down the ladder. George Cukor was directing and he said it was you know a part that was kind of like a tennis anyone, la-di-da kind yeah, of part. Yes. And he said to Cukor, he said, you know, I really don't want to do this, and can you get me out of it? And Cukor said, no, 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 you'll be marvelous, don't worry, it'll be fine. It's very, you know, romantic, sexy kind of part. And Pop said, you know, I just don't think it's right for me. So he went to Selznick. Selznick said, look, i got to make 40 pictures a year. I can't, you yeah. know, juggle you around, you know, it's just not going to work. So he came out, and he was really down and disappointed, and he ran into Charles Bickford, who he had worked on one of his first pictures with. And he said, what do I do? Bickford was a very experienced actor, and he said, tell you what, go in, but it's, it's like a high society guy, right? He said, okay, you play it like a blacksmith. <laughs> he said, you've never heard of tennis. You don't know what the tennis racket is used for. You know what an anvil is, but you don't know about tennis rackets. He said, Just, he said you're going to get some heat for it, and people are going to wonder what the hell you don't know what you're doing as right. far as an actor, but he said, you'll get out of the part. So Pop went in, <laughs> and, he, and he played it, and, he's, and he said it was probably one of his best acting jobs, because <laughs> he's got to play a guy with, you know, the sweater and the yachting right. cap and the tennis racket, and he's got to play it like he right. has lead boots on, you know. 
And he said, Cukor said, no, 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 that will, that, no, no, you can't play it like that. He said, no, no, I'm sorry. D try to do this and this. And Pop said, you know, George, I don't know if I understand this part. <laughs> this is, I think this is the only way I'm going to be able to play it. And so Cukor went over to the phone and he called Selznick and he said, this is impossible. He's impossible. I can't do this. So Selznick says, send him up. So Pop goes up and Selznick doesn't, he doesn't bat an eye. He, Pop walks into his office. He thinks, I'm really going to catch hell now. Mm -hmm. Selznick says, who do you think would be good for that part? <laughs> Pop said, Charles Sterrett, I think he's perfect. He says, telecasting director. <laughs> so he got out of it. So it was, he, he had a way of maneuvering to get in the right place and stay out of the wrong things. Yeah, no, absolutely the case. Well, John, for somebody who, I, I hope this is not the first time someone has discovered Joel McRae by watching this, but invariably, uh, it, it is. It might be useful to talk about the kind of view that you have of uh, of McRae and how he, what kind of career he had in terms of working with 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 directors. What impressed? What what's always impressed you about Joel McRae in that way? Well, uh, just extraordinary the range that the man showed with the directors. I mean, he's a Hitchcock hero, a Wyler hero, DeMille hero, Stevens hero, Hawks hero, I mean Sturgis probably his favorite actor, Peckinpah, I mean, uh, Andre de Toth, Raul Walsh, it, it's extraordinary. But can I just go back to Bird of Paradise for a second? As long as you want. There's a wonderful, they, they, they talk about film today with men and women and uh, uh, the clash and the battle of the sexes. Sequence early on where Joel McRae pins Dolores Del Rio down mm -hmm. and forces her kisses her and, and she struggles and right. he overcomes her. There's a scene 10 minutes later where she comes to him in the night and he's lying on his back and she makes body language say, starts struggling. Right. And oh. she gets on top of him right. yeah. and st he says, Str yes, struggle, struggle. And reversing the, uh, she's on top sexually. It, yeah. it, that's it. That's great. You know, 1932. That's just uh, again two years later. You couldn't. Have right. Done no. That. No. And this this whole notion of uh, at, at the first time around. I mean, he's an eager romantic hero, but is he going too far? And then the degree to which he gets turned into this into this p playfulness, um, and that uh, and that engages in a couple of different levels in the movie because it certainly uh, they both have such strong physical presence in the film. I mean, they're just mm -hmm. stunning to look at as both as a couple but individually in, in scenes. But then there's the way in which this film turns the disadvantages of her presumed Hispanic accent into the advantage of the fact that she's speaking a language that nobody <laughs> except the people in Hawaii understand. Or the, uh, and, the, and that we get this game, this struggle over language uh, as well in the film. Mm -hmm. uh, which includes, uh, you know, the way in which it's implied uh, that, that their, their relationship, you know, progresses with her language acquisition as, um, as, as, as well. And, you know, uh, you and I were chatting a little bit before as well about the way in which there's this, the uh, play with the in innocence or not of some of the, uh, of the encounters, that we assume the encounters are of a less innocent nature, and then uh, there's this, the film seems to roll back on that a little bit narratively. Then it moves forward, then it rolls back with this, with this uh, erotic playfulness mm -hmm. uh, that I think, uh, you know, returns to cinema m many, many years later, but is, uh, you know, exiled for, uh, yeah. for, for, for quite a while. Yeah. Yes, yeah. 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 So um, what about... How did your, your, your father view the, the different sort of stages in, in, in his career? What kind of view, was there any way in which he sort of, uh, uh, all the time thinking of himself as a performer and businessman, mm -hmm. um, what kinds of uh, thoughts did he have about different epics or? Uh, I think he looked at, he was first of all a very unsuccessful extra. He got, he, he tried to be an extra you know, daily and had no success at all and was about to give up on the business altogether and then he got uh, offered a part, a small part. And uh, he actually had grown up on Hollywood Boulevard, literally in Hollywood, on Hollywood Boulevard when it was a dirt road. And he delivered the uh, LA, the, the, the Times to right. Cecil B. DeMille, uh, Tom Mix, Art Acord, Sesu Hayakawa, I mean people that, right. you know, big stars and directors at the time. 
and he saw he would watch Chaplin, you know, making films down the street uh, in La Brea, and so he was around the business. Went to school with Mayer's daughters and DeMille's daughters, so he he really his his first foray into the business was tremendously ins unsuccessful, even though he had all these contacts right. and kind of people that he knew. Um, then once he got going, he got his first lead, which his first lead was, I don't know if you, how much time we have, but if you want, I can tell a story about his, the first lead that he got. We're, we've got a little less than five minutes left okay. the show. Well, I won't go into it then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he, after he got his first lead, that really started a, a trajectory that lasted, I would say, until the mid-40s of really great pictures, really great directors, pretty much one after another, and a continuum up until that point. Then he started in the late 40s, he did a few westerns, and if you look at his career, the first, out of, if you say roughly 90 films, the first 45 he did one western, and the second 45 he did one non-western. Right, okay. So, it's really two halves of his career. Right. Once he got the boots on and the cowboy hat, he said, you know what, I'm too comfortable, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna fight this, and just, so he went with it. And so that was really the second half of his career from about Buffalo Bill on. Right, and of course, you know, with a number of films that uh, should probably be discovered from that period that are not as well known as they are, and certainly with a, towards the end of his career with one of the peaks of that with Sam Peckinpah's Ride the High Country, mm -hmm. uh, really one of the most remarkable westerns from that period, using all of your father's, the mythology of him as a western star, mm -hmm. uh, using uh, him as somebody that the audience would remember as a young man that is now an older, right. uh, older man, right. um, uh, really from another, uh, from another epic. Gentlemen, I hate to tell you this, we have run out of our um, of our time. Uh, if you would like more information about City Cinema Tech, uh, please get in touch with us. And the best way to do so these days is, mm, you guessed it, the internet. You can go to www.cuny.tv. Click on City Cinema Tech. You'll find our schedule. You'll also find ways to communicate with us by email on our site. Let me give that to you again just one more time. That's www.cuny.tv. John, always a pleasure to have you here bringing your immense knowledge about the Hollywood cinema to us. And Peter, it's been a special pleasure bringing the kind Thank of you. knowledge that uh, a son curious about his father, not all sons, but a son very curious about his father's career uh, could share with us today. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And thanks for joining us. We hope you join us again on City Cinema Tech as we look into the archives of film history. Bye-bye for now.